Hi, and thanks for joining me for more sea kayak and adventures. Part 2 of 5 Magical Days Kayaking Off the West Coast of Scotland Ian and I set off from Ellenabach Easdale, kayaking down the Sound of Ling to the southeast corner of Scarborough for the night, then through Corryvreckan the next morning, down Jura's west coast to Glengarrasdale, and on to Corpac and Sheehan Bays, before reaching our destination at Ruin Talon at the north entrance to Loch Tarbot. Sadly, Andy wouldn't be joining Ian and I for the remaining three days after his splendid trip around the Garvelix and a camp on Belnahur. Ah, uh, you should have been coming with us, Andy. Next time. Yeah. Always the next time. Right, guys. That's you on the video. I just put... It's been nice knowing you. <laughs> And the expeditionists, see you guys. Onward to Jura, eh? Scarma and Jura. Heading south to the rough waters of Scarba, the Corryvecan, the west coast of Jura. I'm not jealous at all. <laughs> cheerio, cheerio, cheerio. Setting off in dark skies and a very mixed forecast for a multi-day trip in this area has to be considered very advanced sea kayaking due to its fast tide races and remote landscape as it affords very few landing spots should conditions change. Multi-day kayaking this majestic area of Scotland has to be at the top of every serious sea kayakers list. It's certainly my favourite and one I come back to year after year. It has all the elements required for a great trip. Planning, including using the fast tide races as a bus service, self-sufficient packing, remoteness, a myriad of wonderful wildlife, stunning views and sculpted ancient landscapes with raised beaches and locks. We pass the entrance to Grey Dogs as we head down the Sound of Ling. Working our way down Scarba's east side, past an area known for sea eagles. No eagles this time, but certainly a few wild goats grazing just off the point before rounding westwards towards Corryvreckan. And there it is, the great open mouth of the eastern entrance to the mighty Gulf of Corryvreckan. We wouldn't enter tonight, instead we'd round the corner into the south facing bay to spend the night in Stalker's Bothy, with views down the sound of Jura. First order of business, making a very rewarding evening meal, then later sitting back to relax before bedtime. This is Mr. McEachin, making his grill. The Bothy has seen better days, but still preferable to finding a camp spot and setting up the tent. <coughs> Fine views down the east side of the Sound of Jura. And I'll be sleeping upstairs. I'll be sleeping in here. The room just needed a bit of a sweep to remove the dried pigeon poop and dust before making my bed. A very ingenious fire in the hearth, made from a cutaway propane bottle, 
to help draw the flame and give off extra heat. <sighs> Whiskey time now to kick back, relax and ponder the day. Then recheck our tidal planning for the mighty curry Vrecken tomorrow. You know we use it as a safety margin. Yes. Now time to curl up in a cosy sleeping bag for the night. Our plan to stay in the bothy close to Corryvreckan worked exactly and Shearing would be up and packed right on time to catch the start of the flood stream through to the west. Nature's bus service would be right on time. The main man himself, what chief? I know, I know. chief? A great night. Excellent. What a great day ahead of us. Yeah. The sound of the Corryvreckan is falling. A brighter day and ideal conditions for what lay ahead. A final check and with boats packed we pushed off into the bay. Great night. Signs of morning mist hanging over the top of Scarba and also the higher ground of the north of Jura. Today, she is our friend. Her paddling will be free. Her I'm with Jeff and his Atlantic. Rounding the western tip of the bay, we were now entering the gulf, with eyes on the horizon for any swell and potential wave activity. It's imperative when travelling Corryvreckan east to west that there is minimal swell on the west side as this will most certainly lead to being swept into standing waves across most of the gulf. These waves can be huge and break very unpredictably with the pulsing nature of the tidal stream. I've added some previous drone footage to help viewers understand the unpredictability and complexity of Corryvreckan's nature. Watch closely as even early in the flood cycle without swell, vertical pulses of water are pushed to the surface interacting with the surface laminar flow which would normally just produce a wave train instead it creates breaking waves that randomly appear and produce their own eddy line with any swell from the west and or towards maximum flow these standing breaking waves can be huge any kayaker would struggle and to effect a rescue the whole party would swiftly be swept out on the great race extending five miles westward Corryvreckan's whirlpool, as it is termed, is reputedly the world's third largest and produced as a huge volume of water travelling westward through the 700 foot deep hole or canyon meets a rock pinnacle only 90 feet below the surface, extending out from the Scarba shore, causing the stream to rush 600 foot to the surface and spin clockwise, and a strong eddy from west to east runs down the Scarba shore. An old diving buddy of mine, Graham Bruce from Easdale, dives the pinnacle where meticulous planning of conditions and tides are essential. I've added these shots of a rib and a cruiser on a calm day to clarify how a kayak may fare in my explanation of Corryvreckan. The bay opens up round the corner. I've got five and a half, got five knots. So it's already started. Yeah. yeah. 
Do you reckon we just go straight across? Yeah. It's pointless because when it starts, it goes. So, you've got your beach, your cave is over there. Um, the whirlpool or the turbulence area over falls is just off this point. Over the years, I've slept in the cave overlooking the whirlpool area to study the tidal streams throughout their cycles. If you had a two metre swell coming into this, even at this speed, you'd have stuff standing up. But that's some coastline down Jura, isn't it? We slipped in behind Aileen Beg, an area I've also dived in the past. This area is swept by very fast tidal races, turbulent water and breaking waves on the ebb stream, which often makes it very tricky to enter Jura's Bay of Pigs beyond. We're after the whiskey wreck, Ian. We're after the whiskey wreck. Further south, we said hello to a couple You're of right. scallop divers, kitting up ready to dive. With Cory Vecken well behind us now, the beautiful rugged coastline took on a totally different view, with the odd outlying reef, but more distinctive guard reefs, with their many storm beaches behind. Nice. Always keeping a wary eye seaward for the odd rogue wave, as I recall a member of the group many years ago getting caught out, whacked against the reef, which put a two inch hole in a boat and nowhere to land for some time. On a rough day, this could have been eight to ten miles and a surf landing. Right, Glen Garrasdale Bay and the distinctive red roof and white walled bothy has been a welcoming sight on foul weather days in the past. Such a stunning coastline, it never ceases to impress with its rugged crags and myriad of caves.
Allison's waterfall, named after we made the enforced landing to repair the two inch hole in a boat. Every cloud has a silver lining though, as we ended up with a magnificent pair of antlers after I'd removed the skull from a dead stag we'd found in a cave. Lunch stop at the north end of Korpak Beach with its grassy swathe behind, only to be used as a camp spot in very settled weather. How much? The very peculiar huge sand dune at the south end of Korpak. No other sand dunes exist anywhere on the west of these islands, as far as I'm aware. Wild goats abound along the storm beaches of Jura, with rams often engaged in ferocious battles for dominance over the females. The otter spots Ian and I as it chewed on its catch before quickly diving out of sight. More storm beaches along the entire coastline with their thousands of huge rumbled boulders. Finally, my favourite camp spot on Jura's west side comes into view. Sheehan Bay with its bouldered island at the northern end of a long sandy beach backed by a strip of short crop grass is an idyllic camp in settled weather. Beware west and southerly winds offer little protection from wind and swell. Red deer herds abound and are managed on Jura, providing big business from overseas visitors with big guns and plenty of money. Drone footage from a previous trip gives some idea of Sheehan's beauty, incredible raised beaches left over from the ice age, as the melting ice retreated, relieving its weight the west side of Jura raised up, revealing great swathes of boulder beaches all along the coastline, also uncovering huge once subterranean caves. Sheehan River, with its picturesque waterfall, runs from the many locks around a mile inland, the biggest being Loch Rye Moor. We pressed on to Ruin Talon further down the coast, passing big, once subterranean caves, one of which I'd removed another set of antlers and skull plate from a dead stag a couple of years ago. It's thought sick and injured deer and goats use the caves as retreats until they eventually die of their injuries.
With strong winds forecast, we decided to camp at Ruin Talon, just inside the entrance to Loch Tarbert on the northern shore, where we'd hopefully explore the inner reaches of Tarbert tomorrow. I stopped off at an alternative camp spot, a favourite of mine I've used many times before. It affords better shelter in most wind conditions and close access to the raised beaches above, but doesn't have the splendid views of the Paps of Jura to the south across Loch Tarbot. Brilliant, isn't it? Not sure whether that was intentionally in, but it looked so funny. What are you doing? Rounding this corner, we startled a huge unsuspecting dog otter as it took off into the sea. I think I also caught a glimpse of an eagle that took off close by. Just run off the slab. Oh, it was black. Our first look at a suitable camp spot turned out to be unsuitable, saturated grass at spring tides. Further round was more usable, although a rubble landing with tent pitching near the ruined wall. Ruined Talon Bothy lies further back from the beach and meant a fair carry through boggy ground, so we opted for tents. Further drone footage from a previous trip shows this beautiful location with views around our landing and camp spot, Bothy area, around the corner to show the more sheltered landing spot and caves, and then south to the Paps of Jura and east into Loch Tarbot. also showing the many raised beaches stretching out like grey locks or patches of sand. The large cave on the corner has a wall in front and it used to have animal stalls at the back, presumably used for transporting goods by fishermen or deer hunters. With tents pitched, we settled into some well-earned food and a cuppa. The weather was starting to change rapidly and we knew we were in for a windy night. What we didn't want was winds above the predicted forecast from the southeast, which could spoil tomorrow's plans. If you've enjoyed the video, please like, share with friends, consider subscribing for more of my adventures, and any comments are always welcome. Don't forget to tune in for part 3 coming shortly, and our escape from the west coast of Jura. Subscribe to get notified when it's uploaded. Thanks again for watching.
Well, I'd like to see you want to see it now. <laughs> That's phenomenal. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.